Ambassador Spock, my senior staff. It's not every day that a captain gets to welcome a Starfleet legend aboard. Hmm. You flatter me, Captain Solano. But legend implies the past tense, whereas I am very much focused on our present circumstances. I didn't mean to suggest you were stuck in the past. You're right, Ambassador. Not the most diplomatic choice of words. You are a legend, Ambassador. There's not an officer in Starfleet that doesn't know of your career. I would never assume that to be the case. We were hoping you could fill us in on the details. We got the basics from Starfleet. Two formerly peaceful neighbors are now on the brink of war. Indeed. And the tension between them grows fiercer by the hour. Olydia and Hotari. The Olydians are the more advanced species. They made first contact with the Hotari over a century ago. This is Tau, the Hotari moon. It is rich in dilithium, and for decades, the Hotari and the Olydians have shared a mining operation there. The Olydians provide the technological resources, while the Hotari have served as the labor force. The stability of that arrangement was the source of their peace until recently. The Hotari have suddenly and forcefully seized control of the mining operations and expelled the Olydians from their system. That is the official story, as told by the Hotari when they requested Federation mediation. But the details remain scant. Communications between all parties have been limited by the ionic interference. How is it the Hotari were able to turn the tables and take the mines against superior forces, especially after decades in this arrangement? Unclear. The answer to that question may be the key to a new, lasting peace, and one that I hope we can uncover during these negotiations. But it is unlikely the relatively primitive Hotari forces would stand a chance against the Illidian fleet if this escalates to open war. Left unchecked, this conflict will result in more bloodshed, which is what we are here to prevent. And the dilithium trade hangs in the balance. Clearly the Hotari have been exploited in this relationship. Maybe we can persuade them peace is the more profitable alternative for everyone. They both profited from the mines. And for the Hotari, something is better than nothing. Peace is our objective, after all. That is correct. If we could convince them, it would restore the peace. But we would need the Hotari to accept a difficult compromise. Made all the more difficult by the emotions flaring on both sides, no doubt. Neither the Illidians or the Hotari are members of the Federation, so we can't make them do anything. There is an additional complicating factor I should mention. In the past, the Federation has relied on the Illidians as a source of dilithium. That certainly changes things. The Federation sources its dilithium from a lot of places. Yeah, and this is one of them. That means the Hotari have no reason to trust us. I wouldn't go that far, Commander. We are completely neutral in this matter, on neither one side nor the other. Any suggestion otherwise would compromise our position. Given the Federation's involvement in the Illidium dilithium trade, Captain Solano and I must make every effort to appear neutral in these negotiations. What worries me is, if this whole thing unravels, and we're at the mercy of the storm at less than full strength... We can't let it come to that. Considering what the Ion Storm has done to our ship, and the Ambassador's shuttle, we have to assume the Illidian fleet has had problems with it as well. This recent surge in the energy disturbance temporarily levels the playing field. Commander Westbrook is correct. The energy anomalies around the Hotari systems have been noted in the past. But... They have never been observed on the orders of magnitude we have seen in recent weeks. If it's keeping the two sides talking instead of shooting at each other, that actually helps us negotiate a peace. 
And we'll take advantage of that as long as it works in our favor. And when it doesn't? All the more reason to learn as much about it as we can while we are here. We do not want to be caught unprepared, should the energy anomaly continue to fluctuate. So I trust we understand our circumstances. We're operating on a strict timetable here, and we're going to be leaving for the negotiations shortly. Commander Westbrook, I want you to leverage our systems to investigate the anomaly from here while we're gone. Aye, Captain. Thank you all. Dismissed. I want to speak to both of you privately. Ambassador Spock, I'd like to make a formal introduction. My first officer, Commander Jara Rydek. Commander, as you are aware, there are limits to what Captain Solano and I can do in our official capacity as representatives of the Federation. But someone in an unofficial capacity, your first officer, for example, would not be bound by those restrictions. Commander Ryder could ingratiate herself to certain parties behind the scenes, where they may be more candid in revealing information that could lead to a resolution. She certainly goes her own way. Maybe that helps in this case. I'm perfectly happy to work outside the lines. And by extension, you will be doing your duty, Commander. Just not too far outside the lines. Well, I hope Commander Rydek will have more luck finding out what really happened than we will through official diplomatic channels. The fate of the negotiations, the interests of the Federation, and the prospect for peace may very well depend on it. Mr. Diaz, I understand you have already discussed the warp drive failure with Ambassador Spock? I have. It is imperative that the Ambassador's shuttle be flight ready. I need you both to ascertain the root cause of the system failures he encountered. I'm surprised, Commander. I thought you would have wanted to work on Ambassador Spock's shuttle yourself. I respect the Ambassador and his many accomplishments. But I do not derive any satisfaction from interacting with his shuttle as if it were somehow transubstantiated through its association with him. Especially when I have the entirety of this starship to concern myself with. I am not the chief engineer of this shuttlecraft. The ambassador asked me to take a look, and I'm ready to crack this thing open. Good. You could learn from Mr. Diaz's focus. I'll take notes. Then I will leave you to it. Make note of any abnormalities in your report. Carry on. One nice thing about Vulcans... Chovak is the only person who didn't look at this... ...and treat me like I was something to pity. Doc says I should get used to it. Doesn't mean I want to be reminded of it every minute of the day. Hey, you won't get pity from me. I think it makes you look tough. As tough as you really are, that is. And that makes you sound pretty smart. I might need you to save me for myself next time, though. <laughs> Come on. Let's get to the bottom of this. Ready to go? All set. Let's run the diagnostic. about your talk with Miranda. You... you do? She sent me a Priority One dispatch right after your conversation. I'm happy for you. Both of you. <sighs> Thanks. But I'm only going to tell you this once. Don't screw this up. Because I would be very unhappy if you tried this out and then, I don't know, six weeks or six days later I have to start splitting holidays between the two of you. 
All because things went south and you're not on speaking terms. That just isn't gonna work for me. You really don't believe in me, huh? It's not you. Or her. Just running the numbers and things don't work out more often than they do. I like my friends and I like our group. I don't want to lose that. Is that thing done? Yeah, yeah it's wrapping up. Let's see. The relays along the primary EPS are blown. But the backup relays are all intact. An EPS overload from the warp drive could cause that. But how did the shuttle end up dead in the water? Huh. Well, maybe the ship's data recorder can tell us something. Here. They were only about eight minutes from their plotted warp point. No faults, just those warnings. What are they? Subspace variants out of tolerance. What does that mean? It means the main navigation array lost sight of space somehow. Will the array going offline cause that? Yes, but it should have also thrown a fault code. There was a complete warp cascade failure. Wow. They're lucky the shuttle didn't turn inside out. Makes me think the computer panicked on the warp field equation. The warp field became inverted suddenly. I've seen this happen when the center warp coil cracks. A uh, cracked warp coil throws a fault code. Still, we should take a look. Any one of these failures should have thrown a fault. If it was caused by a system failure. None of this caused the relays to blow. Roll forward to when that happened. Yes, ma'am. So here, they take a moment to get their bearings and they attempt to re-engage the warp drive. There. That's the relays blowing. And look, there's another warp system alert. They're all the same. Subspace variants out of tolerance, or warp inversions. Finally, there's a complete warp cascade failure. Then it's one of two things. Either a warp coil is cracked, or the navigation array is offline. That makes sense. Divide and conquer. You want to check the warp coils or the navigation array? I'll check the other. Let's not overcomplicate this. One of these systems is likely broken. I'll check the nacelles for a cracked coil.
I checked every coil on the port and cell for imbalances. If any coil in either engine were cracked, I would have detected it. So, it must be the navigation array. Except it's not. Checked and double-checked. Well, the readings don't lie. Here comes the security detail for the way team. Hey. I'm not here. We're escorting the negotiating team to the surface as soon as they come down from the bridge. I don't want to interrupt some important work. I was just hoping to see you before I go. The captain and the others will be here any minute now. Should be an interesting ride down to the surface. Come on, I'm never too busy to make time for you. That's not true. <laughs> no. But I am glad you came by. No, that's more accurate. <laughs> I gotta be precise with you, huh? Hey, Maris. Aren't these those button pushers you're always hanging out with? And you're the phaser jockeys we always beat in Parisi squares, right? All aboard for Hotari. Is that another one of the captain's railroad things? <laughs> Gotta be. I just usually zone out by the time he gets to the whole, uh, steam engines were the warp drives of their day part. Catch y'all later. You don't want to miss your train. I do have to go. Not gonna lie, I'd rather not leave right now. That was nice. Yeah, it was. Save some of that for when I get back. You've got a deal. Be seeing you. Edsalar de Diaz. If you could float back down to reality, we still have a ways to go. All right, where were we? So, the warp coils in the navigation array are fine, but the nav computer doesn't seem to think so. I'm out of ideas short of field stripping the shuttle from bow to stern. You wanna take this out of the shuttle and throw it on the bench? Oh, real hands on maintenance. I like it. Okay, the nav computer is patched into the ship. The ship's computer can double check our work. If the shuttle's nav computer is putting out false data, we'll know it. Let's run through the shuttle's logs again. Running now. Same. Warp field inversion and a cascade failure. However, the Resolute computer doesn't show the same subspace variance. We're in the same conditions that the shuttle was in when it failed. Why wouldn't the ship's computer get a matching result? What if... The subspace variance was a momentary occurrence. That's a possibility, and it would explain why the simulation under our current sensor readings failed to reproduce the issue. But a subspace anomaly strong enough to cause a warp field collapse would leave graviton ripples for days. Let's run with the momentary subspace variance theory for now. Roll forward to the shuttle's attempt to re-engage the warp drive. We need the conditions of space around the shuttle at the moment of warp failure. Resuming simulation. Error in warp field calculation. Cochrane formula variables are out of range. That right there. Take the shuttle sensor data from that moment. Computer, why did the warp field calculation fail? Warp field pressure returned non-orthogonal. Results are undefined. That doesn't help. Wait, what if we use a different ship? the Resolute into the simulation instead of the shuttle. Yeah, it should work just fine. Unless... Computer, run the simulation with the Resolute. Resolute simulated. Computer, give me manual control on the warp power. Static field intensity, 
warp 1.1. 1. 1. 1. 1.2. Warp pressure is destabilizing. Error in warp field calculation. The warp drive has experienced a system-wide cascade failure. Warp field collapsed. Subspace variance is out of tolerance. Cochrane formula results are undefined. Bingo. what -o? The same moment when the shuttle failed to warp, so did the ship. Whatever happened to the shuttle just happened to us. The Resolute will not sustain warp. We can't leave Hotari space. Ambassador Spock, Captain Solano, welcome to Hotari. We are honored you've come. My name is Tylus Altaris, Minister of Diplomatic Affairs. The honor is ours, and this is Commander Jara Rydek, first officer aboard the USS Resolute. You'll find she has a keen mind and unique insight into the dynamics between the Hotari and the Lydians. It's very nice to meet you. Likewise. I hope... These must be the representatives of the mighty Federation. The reigning authority in the galaxy. Or so we've been led to believe. Whether that's true or not remains to be seen. But, either way, we're grateful you've made the time to come to our little corner of the universe. And you are? This is Galvin, and this is Citron. The heroes of the revolt in the mines. Let's hope this is the last time we ever have to come here. If you'll excuse me. I think we're about to begin. Did you hear the arrogance from that guy? I don't know what we're walking into here. But that guy was something. That may be true. But let's keep an open mind going into the negotiations. Hopefully he's just one voice amongst many. Then let's hope he's the outlier. The Hotari have invited us as their guests, so we must show them the proper respect. Ambassador Spock, welcome to Hotari Pride. The honor is mine, Your Majesty. That the Federation would send one of their most respected representatives is not only an honor to the Hotari people and their queen, but a recognition of our stature and importance. Let's get on with it, shall we? With all due respect to the Federation and their ambassador, they have no authority here. We are not members of their alliance. We are not subject to their rule, nor yours. We demand the immediate return of all mining operations to Elydian control, as it has been for centuries and will be for centuries more. That has always been our understanding. That understanding has changed. Then you invite war. And if you cannot remain silent, you will be silenced. But his point is well taken. 
What is the Federation's interest in this matter? Perhaps you would have us trade one oppressor for another? The Federation remains neutral. Our only interest is the peaceful resolution of this conflict. We are here at your request, Your Majesty. For now. I'm trying to keep an open mind here, but it's not easy. I thought they wanted us here. Was there something you wanted to say, Captain? Oh, no. My apologies. And what about the Cobliard? She's not part She can of... speak for herself, can't she? Then let her. Now then, what is your name? Commander Jara Rydek, Your Majesty. Being a Kobiard, you would know better than anyone. Your people suffered brutal treatment at the hands of the Cardassians. Their injustice towards the Kobiard is as unimaginable as it is unforgivable. Not unlike how we have been treated by the Alidians. As much as they'd have you believe they are the victims here, remember it was the Hotari who attacked us. Hundreds of innocent Alidians were slaughtered without mercy in those mines. The blood is on their hands, not ours. Quiet! If after all the Kobliards suffered, you finally had the chance to right that wrong, to get out from under their control, would you take it? Or would you negotiate a peace? There is no remedy for what the Kobliad suffered. And I fear who we might have become in pursuit of it. There is no justice if the oppressed become the oppressor. So I would willingly accept a peaceful resolution if it were offered. That is the real opportunity. Perhaps, Commander Rydak. Perhaps. Unfortunately, that was not the case, was it? No. It was not. Peace is often elusive to those who need it most. The Federation is the most powerful, most advanced alliance in the galaxy. It's widely known we have an abundance of dilithium in our minds. And it's in your interest to secure a steady supply. Your Majesty, if I may. Ambassador Spock would have us believe you're here as a neutral party in the interest of peace. So why are you really here? I want the truth. Not your Federation rhetoric. I'm sorry, Your Majesty, but it's really not my place to say what the Federation's interests might be. You are their representative. I am. But Ambassador Spock is better suited to address your concerns. What they haven't said, but cannot deny, is a simple truth. The dilithium trade would not and will no longer exist without a Lydian involvement. We created it for the benefit of everyone, especially the Hotari. We've given them warp technology. We've let them share in the profits. We've made their lives infinitely better than before Dilithium was discovered. All of that goes away if the Federation turns a blind eye to their treachery. That is enough of your lies! The Hotari are quite capable of running the mines. We've done so for centuries. So tell me, who deserves control of the dilithium trade and the mines on Tau? Who should the Federation recognize? The Hotari or the Alidians? It can only be one or the other, not both. If there can only be one, 
Then it would be in the best interest of all involved if the Elidians resumed operation of the mines. And that is why we should not trust our fate to the Federation. She speaks sense. You do well to listen to her. And you do well to hold your tongue. We will take back our minds by any means necessary. Then you will see more blood spilled. I am more than willing to address your concerns, Your Majesty. Yours as well, Representative. But I suggest we could have a more productive conversation with a smaller group. Perhaps only the most essential representatives. I would agree, Ambassador Spock. I think this is best left to those of us with more experience in diplomatic matters. Spock and I will cover everything on the diplomatic front. You make nice with the locals and see if you can get some answers. We need to find out why the Hotari are so willing to risk war. What happened in those mines? 